to ensure is that you fill out this um, survey so that we're able to hear exactly what it is that you require. Now these webinars are being live tweeted on Twitter and you can follow us at PS Quit Smoking use, and also use the following hashtag TeachWebinar. Now the Teach Curriculum and Slides are developed and comp compiled with funding from the Government of Ontario, specifically Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. And a lot of our content is primarily based on evidence-based guidelines from the following three sources. The materials really only serve at, and the verbal presentations and any discussions really only serve as general principles and approaches, but they don't constitute clinical advice, and we do advise that there is a need for individualized clinical assessment by healthcare professionals. Now joining us today is Dr. Peter Selby, the Chief of the Addictions Program and the Head of the Nicotine Dependence Clinic at the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health. He is also the PI of the KD, which includes the TEACH and the, Pro and the STOP projects. These are Dr. Selby's disclosures, and without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to him. Thank you very much, Leah, and thank you everybody for being here as well as for coming online. As you know, we usually do this, uh, I don't usually have a live audience here, but uh, this is great to see uh, people here. So uh, if you've seen the Surgeon General's report, it's kind of interesting to see what some of the other conditions to which smoking has been linked, including blindness, the diabetes, and in fact, if you haven't been to one of our talks, we do have a talk on the association between diabetes and smoking. And about 12% of diabetes, type 2 diabetes now, can be accounted for by people smoking, at least in North America, based on these meta-analyses done. So we're still trying to find a disease to, in which smoking does not either have a causal role or affects its prognosis. So it, it's safe to say that uh, <clears throat> one of the reasons why I picked this topic is because we, I do see people as well who present with pain conditions. One way to think about people with addictions is that they have a pain problem, but the pain problem is more psychic pain, uh, and that often we believe that they use drugs to self-medicate. So following that, I started asking my patients about their pain, and you'll be surprised how many people with addictions actually have physical pain. And many times we see people on opiates, and they're trying to quit smoking, and they, they look kind of different. Uh, I had this patient who uh, actually was on a pain medication for chronic back pain and uh, essentially told me that he can't get the surgery because his surgeon won't operate uh, while he's still smoking. And so it got me interested into looking into this further and as we looked into this further it became very interesting to me that we need to pay attention to the issue of smoking and pain. And so what you're going to really uh, look at is we're going to start looking at what is, what is some of that pharmacology of nicotine as it's related to pain? Uh, if you have somebody with a pain problem and we're trying to address their smoking, is that really a good idea or is that, is that going to be just uh, difficult for them to do? And the other thing is, how do we integrate it if we're going to do it? So three objectives for today. Uh, I'm just going to use the full screen so that everybody can see what it is. Now, it's not as simple as we'd like to believe. We know in lab animals, nicotine is actually an analgesic. In fact, if you take a look at every drug of abuse, whether it's cocaine, nicotine, alcohol, all opiates, of course, all of them actually have an analgesic component to them, which means at some level, they're affecting people's experience of pain. Now, nicotine actually has this effect on pain both in the central nervous system as well as in the peripheral nervous system. And there are specific receptors on which nicotine acts, which often cause people to get addicted, the nicotinic receptors. But it's not as simple as that, because there is a paradox. If you have or are a smoker, you're at increased risk of developing back pain and other chronic pain disorders. Now, we'll, come, we'll explore a little bit of why that may be. It may not be as simple as, as, as you'd like to believe. But also, if people who smoke and have chronic pain, their pain intensity scores on average are higher than those who don't smoke. So, so what is this association about? Uh, and how do we understand this paradox? So obviously, let's start taking a look at the pharmacology of these receptors, because if you don't understand where nicotine is going in the brain and where these receptors are, it becomes hard to, uh, to figure this out. 
So clearly this receptor where nicotine acts is widely spread. It's, it's a very primitive receptor. It's widely spread amongst many animal species as well as in ours. And it's, it, it, its basic functions often have to do with things like arousal as in waking up and being alert, sleep, anxiety, cognition, and pain. Now, if you activate this receptor, this cholinergic receptor, many different neurotransmitters, other neurotransmitters can get affected, such as dopamine, which we know is often associated with a uh, reward, uh, GABA, which is often in, in, is also associated with addictions, but is also associated with inhibition in the brain, and glutamate, another receptor associated with inhibition, but also affects serotonin, histamine, and norepinephrine. So it's a when we activate those receptors, we activate a whole bunch of other receptors as well. So this is just a very uh, uh, complex diagram for, for, for those of you who haven't done a neuroanatomy. But basically, it's just showing you all the various receptors. These are kind of nicotinic receptors at which where nicotine may be having this effect on how it modulates that experience of pain. These are all the studies that look at experimental studies, and I'll just summarize them for you in the next slide. But nicotine in, in experimental studies will produce analogies in human models of experimental pain. So often, you know, you get people to put their hands into a cold bucket of ice, or you cause them a clamp, and you cause physical pain in, in volunteers, of course. This is not part of torture. So you, and you do see nicotine making a difference. Either by the nasal spray or patch will reduce the pain sensitivity in both smokers and non-smokers. Smoking a cigarette decreases awareness, often increased tolerance to some of these experimental pain stimuli. So it appears to be nicotine is actually the mediator of this, not simply moving a hand to mouth and getting distracted. Uh, there are possibly additional substances in cigarette smoke, uh, because if you have denicotinized cigarettes, or um, you, you, do, you do not get the same effect. So as you know, cig a cigarette has about 7,000 chemicals. It has MAO in inhibitors in it. So there's all sorts of modulators, neuromodulators that are in smoke, uh, some of them yet to be defined, uh, that may be causing some of these effects or moderate, moderating some of these effects. The other issue that when you're dealing with smokers who are in pain, we don't know whether when they smoke a cigarette and tell us that their pain is better, is that because we're just terminating withdrawal? If you, you were here earlier this morning, you heard about in the, in, in, in the uh, addiction recovery home, but initially when people were smoking and drinking coffee, by the time they came to their relaxation groups, they were all bouncing off the wall. And as soon as the place became smoke-free and people had nicotine replacement and they were in a steady state of nicotine, they were all calm. So a lot of the effects that we attribute to nicotine may actually just be simply we're getting people out of withdrawal may have nothing else uh, to do with whether it's actually actually causing a reduction in pain, per se. Yeah. Uh, so again, one of the things is you, we have to make sure that we are not getting confounders in this. Because when you smoke a cigarette, your blood pressure and your heart rate goes up. So is that because a person's in pain or, or something else? So it's, it's tough to make these, these, uh, these associations. The other area that we have to pay attention to is the issue of smoking and post-operative pain. And why is this becoming important? So what started happening, at least in the last 10 years, is there's uh, quitting smoking for safer surgery because, one, if you quit smoking before six to eight weeks prior to surgery, your risk of complications during the surgery dropped dramatically from anesthesia complications. Secondly, if people are having surgery, for example, any orthopedic procedure, the outcomes are worse if the person is still smoking. If you do transplants, outcome isn't as good. If you do chemotherapy, radiation therapy, or any surgery for cancer, the outcome isn't good. So uh, right now, what has happened is orthopedic surgeons have actually taken this on as part of their society's mission is to actually have quit smoking pre-op as a standard. You know, similar to having going fasting before you have an operation, moving towards having pre-op smoking cessation. And a lot of this shows that um, you can see um, that nicotine may or may not have some Im improvements in the uh, analgesia, uh, and there are mixed results. So very simply, si uh, simply, people who do not smoke, in people who are not tolerant to nicotine, if you do give them nicotine, they may have some analgesic effects. And we don't recommend doing that because more often than not, those people will vomit. So you don't do that. But for people who do smoke, because they've been desensitizing their nicotine receptors because of that repeated exposure and withdrawal, 
Uh, giving them nicotine very often is not going to affect their pain one way or the other, but we do want from a from a healing, wound healing perspective and complication perspective, the perioperative period becomes very important. So that's the acute pain kind of story that we have, and then we're going to go into the chronic pain uh, and story because that seems to have, is, is more relevant right now because we're dealing with an epidemic of prescription drug use, and uh, we are seeing people coming into treatment for all of that. So basically the bottom line is there are mixed results about this. Many of the studies that have been done have poor methodological qu quality that you could actually make any uh, clear recommendation one way or the other or, or association. But from the epidemiological studies, what you say is that we know biologically, yes, smoking can affect your central nervous function. And um, one of the possibilities is that people who are susceptible to smoke are also uh, susceptible to chronic pain that we don't know. Uh, and the history of this association is there. So there's the, that association that the, the direction of that causality is difficult to, uh, to make. When you look at the prospective cohort studies, uh, and you look at the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and uh, long-term studies, uh, you can start seeing this one, which is the duration is 37 years or 33 years. You can see the increased risk of hospitalization for intervertebral disc disorder, increased risk of low back pain. What we also need to uh, understand is that basically, when you smoke, uh, basically your risk for osteoporosis goes up, right? Because essentially, smoke is an anti-estrogen, so it's wiping out all the effects of estrogen, especially in women, uh, putting them at increased risk. So just to summarize, when people who smoked, uh, based on this uh, review by Yushi, is that you get greater pain intensity, increased number of painful sites, the pain persists, and greater long-term disability. And so again, if you have patients, for example, with fibromyalgia who are chronically in pain, Looking at what the effect of cigarettes is on that pain experience is, is critical. So in looking at we, how does this actually mediate this experience of pain, one of the mechanisms or some of the potential mechanisms that are of interest is one, are people who have uh, addictions in general or smoking specifically, uh, do they perceive pain differently? Do they process pain differently? Are they more sensitive? Has the tobacco smoke uh, created some structural damage to some particular systems in the brain that make them more sensitive? We know that, at least in a developing fetus, nicotine is a neuroteratogen, which means it destroys specifically the number and volume of, of receptors that this kid is going to have. So how, is that being, are we setting the stage by that exposure early in life for people to actually uh, have harm? And while smoking, are they actually getting damage to their brain? Uh, we also know that there's an association between chronic pain, depression and mood disorders, and smoking. So is there something common to all three, or is there some relationship between the three of these things? We cannot discount the psychosocial factors that as we see pain and uh, addiction and mental health and smoking as an addiction are all concentrated in those who have less than high school education, much more likely to be in blue collar uh, uh, workers and people with social disadvantage. So is there something there that is causing the expression in these different ways? The other issue is that do opioids themselves make people more sensitive to pain? And clearly in the opioid clinic, we noticed in chronic pain, often people who are taking Percocets and, and short-acting uh, opioids are often in more pain than when they started out. And they get this pain sensitivity. And uh, simply <laughs> detoxifying them or, or switching them to a long-acting opioid that pain sensitivity returns. So opioids themselves may make them more sensitive to chronic pain. And there may be other effects in cigarettes that we yet have yet to, uh, to determine. So just to summarize, there's uh, evidence of altered pain processing. And these are all the ways in which it could do that from nicotine desensitization, increased nicotine tolerance, nicotine withdrawal. Uh, uh, there's a shorter pain latency to heat. This is what's been found. Uh, reduced tolerance to electric pain stimulation. Uh, pain-induced reinforcement of uh, smoking behavior, and neuroendocrine changes, which basically is this down-regulation of the stress response. So this pain processing uh, aspect may play a critical role in how smoking and chronic pain are associated. What about the structural damage to other systems? We talked about the osteoporosis. When you, women who smoke are you know, 
four to ten times as risk of having a fracture, primarily because of the osteoporosis. You may have more spinal degenerative disease uh, because of the uh, structural damage, and as we talked about, impaired bone healing because primarily because of the reduced oxygen uh, carrying capacity of the blood. And uh, again, the uh, trauma. If, if you you know if you look at a, a fracture below the knees, it's a hundred day difference between a, to time to healing between a smoker and a non-smoker. So that's about three months extra. So can you imagine the pain that potentially gets set in place for something like that? We talked about depression. Uh, again, as we said, uh, they are more common, may increase susceptibility. The whole idea of self-medication of depression by cigarettes is a whole other area of research that, that's happening here at CAMH. And it, you can think about it. Smoke has nicotine, which is an antidepressant effect. It has two MAO inhibitors, both an MAO-A and an MAO-B inhibitor, which makes it the complete antidepressant that people are using. The downside is it may not be a very potent antidepressant because people are still depressed and showing up. Uh, and as we said, depression and pain tend to uh, coexist as well. We talked a little bit about the psychosocial factors, about being marginalized, lower socioeconomic status, uh, high in unemployment and the interaction with opioids. Uh, we talked about the cross-tolerance between nicotine and opioids. One of our researchers here at CAMH, one of our postdocs, did a study looking at the kinetics of how and the dynamics of, of smoking, nicotine, and methadone, and, could, and how patients navigate their smoking and their methadone treatment, and one helps offset the other. So there's a, a huge interplay between their opioids and their smoking. And I can tell you in the clinic, these are the ones who need higher doses of nicotine, they tend to smoke more frequently, and they have a harder time quitting uh, uh, than other, uh, some of our other patients. The other issue that occurs is smoke has carbon monoxide. So, you know, you're getting in a pack a day, you're maybe getting 200 milligrams of carbon monoxide a day. And so, again, there may be some damage, especially to nerve endings, increasing pain sensitivity because of neuropathic pain. So putting it all together, if you want to take a look at how smoking may be causing these things, the evidence in this review points to all these various factors that <coughs> may be in place. So I think the net take-home message in the absence of complete data is that the current evidence supports that smoking is probably a risk factor for chronic pain. Uh, and we don't know whether chronic pain is a risk factor to take up smoking because most smoking has uptake is, happens in people's adolescence, so, so we can't really say that, but uh, we do know that smoking may set people up for developing chronic pain syndromes. And again, we need better uh, understanding of how this is uh, happening. So that's just the basic science and the summary of the basic science or the basic understanding of, of how this may be occurring. Given that, what are the clinical implications? So in post-op pain, Smoking status, you know, we're not sure what to do, but the person is going to be in withdrawal. So as we know, most hospitals now have uh, nicotine replacement on formulary for the post-op period. Uh, so that may be important, but, um, you know, it doesn't mean you have to alter the way we do any kind of analgesia. We just need to make sure these people are not in nicotine withdrawal rather than trying to snow them with uh, opioids or other medications, you know, uh, provide them the nicotine replacement they need. And again, this is the other question when you take a look at Warner, Turan, and Olson. There are three studies here that have talked about this. Can NRT contribute to the analgesia in the people who smoke? And I mean, it did not improve postoperative analgesia, it did not improve withdrawal symptoms, and therefore you really need to think about what's the purpose. I mean, if somebody's hooked up in an ICU and can't move and you know is in on a pump and is kind of sedated, providing nicotine replacement doesn't add much benefit. It's actually when they start ambulating and starting to walk and get out there, that's when we need to maybe start managing that, that motivation for smoking. Now, when you look at the outcomes of chronic pain treatment, what moder mo moderates that? Clearly, if people have depression. So when we look at our, our, our patients who have chronic pain, which are not responding to standard treatments, are, are not functioning, if there's an underlying depression, which often does occur in about 30 to 40 percent of patients, at least if you you know, at a clinical level, uh, that is not they're not going to get back to being functional. That pain is not going to disappear. And also, what has not been studied well, but we are beginning to notice, is that uh, the population also has a history of other kinds of psychological trauma 
that is often playing itself out in the persistence of the chronic physical pain. The other thing, as we know, substance use will change that uh, primarily because uh, the, the chaos in the life of somebody who's got a substance use disorder, as well as there may be some aspects of substance use that makes withdrawal particularly harmful or hard, and trying to get people who are actively abusing opioids, their chronic pain under, under control is, is an impossibility. So you really need to, we need to make sure that that happens together. And again, if there is uh, unemployment, or there's much more persistent disability. So, uh, so we do need to take a look at that. With respect to an observational study of a three-week multidisciplinary pain rehab program, uh, smokers did equally well. It wasn't, you know, it was may they in fact may have done better uh, despite the greater pain reported by them at program entry. And nobody's sure why this is. Is this because the motivation to go have a cigarette makes you get up and walk and you put up with the pain? We don't know, right? Uh, you, you, because remember, what if you ask somebody who's addicted to tobacco what they'll do to get a cigarette? You know, people have gone out in snowstorms. They've, they've walked out of the hospital in the freezing cold. They've done all sorts of things, right? So is that what was driving the, the actually ambulation? Uh, was withdrawal actually driving it or was there actually uh, something else? Not sure. Um, it did not prevent successful CBT and rehabilitation for pain treatment either, so something to keep in mind. However, motivation and intent to quit smoking is high. And as you heard earlier this morning, uh, we know widespread in the mental health and addiction system, it's not as if the patients are not ready. It's us as practitioners who have a hard time making it happen. And uh, you heard the story today about how they made that happen at one, at one center. Uh, uh, again, you know, people are not just defined by that diagnosis so just getting the pain under control is not the only priority you may sequence it or do it concurrently but you really need to pay attention to it because overall quitting would dramatically improve long-term health for that person so again you she comes back to this issue of smoking cessation outcomes of the short-term abstinence usually uh, less than six months may worsen pain symptoms and complicate concurrent efforts to treat pain so this becomes careful if how you're trying to get people to quit smoking when they have an active pain disorder, uh, and it may be taking away their primary coping mechanisms to control stress and anxiety. So if you have somebody in acute pain, clearly it makes sense to treat their acute pain. Nobody's saying, no, no, you have, you, unless you quit smoking, you're not getting your pain management. But you do want to make sure that their, their pain is well managed. And again, recovery from the long-term effects of exposure to nicotine may improve chronic pain. Uh, and helping them adopt new coping mechanisms will help prevent relapse. So this is not any different than how we would treat somebody else's uh, concurrent condition when they have tobacco. So if the person's ready, do it concurrently. If they're not, do it sequentially. Uh, ideally, if you have uh, pre-op patients, you want to do it before they have the painful condition, if it's, if it's one of those things. Um, there's a whole idea of what further research needs to ha happen. Is tobacco abstinence affecting chronic pain in terms of uh, if we get people to quit with either NRT or bupropion or verniclin, over time, is that person's chronic pain better uh, under control? And again, how do you help them quit smoking? Uh, you heard earlier this morning that we are doing this study here of uh, transcranial direct cortical stimulation for smoking cessation, but that's also being used in chronic pain. So are there, and you know CBT is used in chronic pain as well as in smoking cessation. So it may be able to do the similar skill sets or similar treatments might have an effect in, in more than one place, but they need further study. Um, so again, looking at the parallel of, of why we would not, we, we, you know, in mental health patient populations, we've often uh, ignored their smoking status because we are often the last healthcare facilities to ban it and have programming for them. And we often make this assumption that their mental health would worsen. Uh, but now that whole uh, belief has changed and we are now specifically uh, creating programming for that population. And so uh, with patients with chronic pain, we may be in the same boat, we may be having to start thinking, thinking about how we are going to provide them uh, service. So just to summarize, the basic science of chronic pain and nicotine use is not as clear, uh, but we do know there are multiple factors that are at play as to why a patient with chronic pain will smoke and why a person who smokes may be at increased risk for chronic pain. 
With respect to the clinical implications, we are still in early days about what we need to do, but that's exactly the reason for this seminar is to start thinking about what do we need to do and how do we need to start making some of those changes for people who both suffer from chronic pain, maybe be giving opioids, may require surgery, and maybe in a, a pre-op or post-op state and need their nicotine uh, uh, and the tobacco addiction managed. And what are the options that we could give them? Is it uh, nicotine replacement? There's one study that we did in partnership with the Toronto Western Hospital uh, using veriniclin in a pre-op uh, clinic and uh, found that clearly people were motivated, people were able to quit and sustain their quit post-op. It did not affect uh, surgical outcomes because it was a mixed clinic and it was a short-term follow-up. But uh, that paper got published a couple of years ago and uh, again shows that maybe veriniclin might have a role uh, in this. So, uh, without further ado, I'll open up the floor as well as the webinar for questions, if I can do this right. Just press the screen. Press that button again, the screen button. Ah, okay, there we are. All right. So, we ha I'm going to start with the questions online because we often never get to them uh, otherwise. And why don't we just... Uh, Excuse the scroll bar. Okay. So, uh, go that. So, it's a very interesting and lots of good information. Is there a resource that we can go to obtain more info on this topic? Clearly, the references are available. And what we will be doing, as you know, we, we released our first uh, frequently asked questions um, resource document for you guys. And what we'll do is take this and add and see how we can add and extract the information to make it uh, available to everybody. So hopefully that will work for you. Um, so Mark says he works in a multidisciplinary six-week chronic pain program, and the people who smoke tend to smoke more because of, uh, can't seem to move that, oops, uh, more because of dealing with other issues in their life that cause them an increase in stress. And I think that's one of the things that we talk about is that Smoking as a way to manage stress is really what often people will tell us that that's what they do. And, you know, it's a bit complex. That's the given reason. And often we have to talk with them about other ways to manage that. And what we often notice is that actually after they've quit or they are on a maintenance treatment of nicotine replacement, their stress is actually less because they're not going in and out of withdrawal or not in and out of being anxious. So. Uh, you're right, and so it does require acknowledging where they are starting out with, that there is stress, and thinking about how they might uh, might address uh, uh, their tobacco use in, in, in the face of having stress. And others do quit smoking as a goal and replace their smoking with other coping mechanisms, and hopefully mark those are healthy ones. Um, yeah, tra uh, it's actually uh, a DTCS, direct transcranial stimulation. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and that is experimental, but it is also, uh, yes, it has been used for severe depression. Um, with respect to affecting uh, cravings with smoking, the jury is still out. The research is being done to see whether, in fact, it does. But the theory behind the brain stimulation or, is that it actually increases learning. And that's why we, you know, in the, in the studies that we're doing, we give it just before they go in for their CBT session to see if, in fact, that enhances what they learn. So it, the jury's still out. It's still experimental. But these are, these, are, these, are, these are possible for the future. Marilyn asked a question about verniclin safety in elderly patients and at what dose. Uh, again, verniclin, as you know, can be used across the age ranges. Uh, the only thing is people are getting elderly. You want to make sure that their kidney function is, is fine and that their kidneys are not uh, can tolerate. And if they have kidney disease, a lower dose needs to be used. The pharmacist or the doctor can, can advise you. There's a guidance about how to do that. Uh, and generally, they can easily take it. Can you make the chat the right way? Screen because people can't see and they want to see. Okay. Uh, um, try to use the I got to do something. Sorry, I've been asked to. Why, why are you doing this? Why don't I take some? Are there any questions from the people here while Leah is trying to fix the the screen. Okay. If not, okay. 
Sorry, we're going to have to just do that. Yeah, we'll just yeah. do that. Okay. Um, so what are the other questions coming up? Um, I think there's a question with Libra and Zion. Yeah. Uh, it's a good question because it, it plays for the people who are not in psychotic, you're going to have enzyme induction and they're going to have a decrease when they score. Yeah. So there's a question about liver enzyme and smoking and if it plays a role. You know, for antipsychotic, when yeah. people smoke, they have uh, cytochrome induction right. and they have a lower, uh, a lower circulating level of antipsychotic and in some people. So resuming smoking for after hospitalization will precipitate an antipsychotic relapse. The question for pain, are, they, are there some opioids that are also uh, processed by the cytochrome system and where the same mechanism will play a role? So, so that's a great question. We've looked at uh, basically the, uh, with methanol it doesn't. There isn't any uh, induction that happens there. And for most other opioids, it doesn't seem to be the reason. It, it, so what we would say in that case, it's not a kinetic interaction, which means it's not affecting the metabolism. But there may be a dynamic interaction, which means how the brain modulates itself. So, the, so rather than actually an interaction between uh, how the, the drugs are broken down by the body or, or, uh, or metabolized by the body, it's what the drug does to the body gets moderated or modulated by the opioid and the smoking. So, uh, so that's a great question. It isn't uh, uh, that. And thank you, Leah, for bringing my You have to keep it my in that So i got to figure out how to now go up to the next question. We went to that one. Um, so Candace, a question is a good question. We don't know. I mean, this is the issue that's coming up because as you look at people who are coming in chronic pain, they are younger patients. And we are constantly finding people who are coming to quit much older. And our opportunity with our mental health clients, our addicted clients, is that they come to us um, earlier. Chronic pain clients often come to us earlier in their lives. So if we can actually help them now, we are potentially helping prevent the future cancer patient, the future heart disease patient, the future stroke patient, et cetera. So that's a great question. We don't know. And I think this is the area where we need to, also one of the areas where we need to stimulate that kind of research. Um, OK, so Mark asked about the resource. It's on the TEACH website. The FAQ is posted on the <laughs> TEACH website. It's on the right-hand side of the page, I think. And there's a clear link to download the FAQs. Uh, and then for these resources, uh, we will be adding the, to that uh, in, in the next few weeks or months. Um, Osnet asked the question, are there any particular medications used for pain, like tricyclics, opioids, that should be monitored, adjusted when a uh, patient decreases, stop smoking? As I said, not really. One of the things that we do know is there's a tricyclic called nortriptyline that if you look at the evidence for smoking cessation, actually the odds ratios with that medication is about three. So this comes out of the work of Sharon Hall from San Francisco. And the meta-analyses also suggest that that's actually a very effective way to quit smoking. It's a very cheap way to quit smoking. Uh, and these tricyclics in low doses are also used in the management of chronic pain. Now, no one has done a study of the use of tricyclics in patients with chronic pain and smoking and to see if that medication will make a difference. But that's a great question, Osnet. And uh, we don't know whether any of these medications need to be uh, reduced or stopped. Generally, uh, that decision around opioids uh, tends to be made up, uh, based on patient uh, a pain response. OK, so Kim asked, uh, for patients consuming two or more packs per day and chronic pain and enroll in STOP study, would you start them on? more than 21 milligram patch right away. So not to offer any direct patient advice on this uh, forum, one of the things, as you know, uh, that on average, per cigarette, somebody is pulling about a milligram of nicotine. They can pull up to three milligrams of nicotine, depending on number of puffs. So, and the patch replaces approximately, a one milli uh, 21 milligram patch replaces about 50% of what you would get from a pack of cigarettes. So generally, we know we are often in a deficit when we are starting somebody like this on a heavy, on a, uh, who's a heavy smoker. But if you have a heavy smoker, you can start with that. They may concurrently smoke, or we give them breakthrough like pack inhaler, lozenge to manage the cravings. 
reassess them in a week and bump up the patch at that point because by then you know whether they can tolerate the patch, whether they can, you know, because you may have somebody who's smoking two cigarettes a day, but most of the cigarettes are just burning themselves in the ashtray and, um, and they may not be getting that in. So we at the clinic generally start low and then build the dose up based on the response we get because sometimes we've had these, you know, two pack a day smokers who are completely just, you know, they, they just stop with just one patch or gum or inhaler. So we always start with that, see how they respond and then bump it up. I tend to be a bit more conservative. I don't start just because they're telling me they're smoking two packs a day that I just start with two patches. Others do. We don't, I just don't do that myself. Um, is there a role for RTMS? Yeah, some of our researchers here at ChemH, Dr. George and Dr. Daskalakis have been doing a study looking at RTMS for uh, smoking cessation and I don't think their results are out yet, but uh, uh, there are some studies out in other parts of the world where it looks at RTMS. Um, so, so that's, in, that's, that's interesting to know. We do know there are certain brain regions which uh, in, in, um, that if stimulated appropriately may lead to an aversion to smoking. So, uh, so that, is, that evidence is there. It hasn't yet translated into a clinical program yet. Uh, we asked, answered the question about uh, liver enzymes and, uh, okay, you want to see that? All right. So Marilyn asked the question, when NRT is used with psychiatric patients, do they tend to need less psychiatric medications or is this only when they discontinue use of all nicotine, either NRT or cigarettes? That's a great question, Marilyn. It's one of the things that people think, that it's the nicotine that's causing the psychiatric medications to be thrown out of the body faster. It's actually the smoke. So when people smoke, smoke has any smoke, any vegetable matter, you inhale enough of it, your uh, enzymes in your liver, the cytochrome P450s, uh, specifically 2A1, will get induced, which means it gets speeded up, and that starts breaking down everything else that comes in that gets broken down by that enzyme, including psychiatric meds. So when we switch people to nicotine, uh, that's not going to affect... Uh, the, the psychiatric level medications. So often within a week or two <laughs> after starting uh, NRT and they've, they've stopped smoking completely, patients will report they've, either their medications are working better or they're feeling kind of drowsy. And so we may in those situations make an adjustment to the medication uh, down. There's a medication called olanzapine and if somebody's smoking uh, with olanzapine, they're basically they're roughly they're needing a third more of the dose. Uh, than they would if they were not smoking, because that's how much gets ex thrown out by, uh, by that. And I think that was so shown by, in one of the studies done by Dr. Bruce Pollock here at CAMH, or when, actually before he came to CAMH. Uh, what else? Um, has a difference in smoking and use of nicotine patch been addressed? Yes. Uh, okay. Oh, so the question from the audience was, again, we, we've covered it. It was about the... Um, uh, psychiatric medication, then we just cover that. So that was a question. All right. So are there any other comments, questions about tobacco and smoking? Are and questions? are there more questions? Oh, Can sorry. I think. Okay. I think that's study. it. Study. Okay. So after the questions, in the in the last bit, what we do for you, for, especially for those of you online, is get down to the case study. So the case study uh, is really to take a look at uh, uh, an older 62-year-old female retired biochemist who's married. Uh, she comes with the referral of a family doctor. She has multiple health problems, which her family doctor believes has been made worse by her smoking. He rec recommends that she lose, quit smoking and lose weight. At your appointment, you find that she starts smoking age 15, so adolescent onset. Quit during the first pregnancy at age 32, so we know that often can happen. Uh, again, relapse, 60% of pregnant women will go back to smoking after being diagnosed. And then um, later on, diagnosed with uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis at the age of 40. Uh, because of the stress of uh, that, uh, coupled with a demanding career and raising three children, led to a relapse. And in fact, if you go back to the Surgeon General report right now, they've become very clear about the association between smoking and rheumatoid arthritis as well. So, so this is in keeping with that. Uh, her, her 
bones in her feet have been collapsing. She has scoliosis with protruding discs and they put pressure on her nerves. She has numbing sensation in her feet. Uh, she also suffers from Crohn's disease and causes severe abdominal uh, discomfort and chronic pain. Uh, taking oxycodone and acetaminophen for the pain and diclofenac for her arthritis. And it appears that she has beginnings of macular degeneration. She's currently 40 pounds overweight and is restricted from physical activity due to her ailments. So in thinking about what are the central issues in this case, what are her barriers to change? If Sue came to see you realistically, where would you start? And how would you integrate interventions addressing this patient's tobacco use as well as interventions targeting other co-occurring risk factors? So what we'll do in this case study is, while you're online, feel free to discuss as a group uh, for, with, with each other, but also start typing up uh, your answers. And we'll ask people in the audience as well to think about how would they even start approaching? I know we have some clinicians from the clinic, so we better <laughs> they're going to have to be put on the spot as to how they might approach uh, a client like that who's fairly weak. I mean, 70% of our patients who show up here also have a physical health complaint. 75% have a mental health disorder. 70% have another physical health complaint. And this is not uncommon. So if I can pick on some of our clinical staff in the back, uh, what are the central issues that you see in this case? Yeah. Okay, you, I'm going to need you to use the mic. I can come over. Oh, sorry, they need to see you. Sorry. They don't need to see you. We just need to make sure that the phone conference can hear you. And it's only working, as you said, close to the phone. Okay. Sorry, Alex. Sorry, Alex. Don't worry, we won't put you on camera. <laughs> So Alex is the nurse in our clinic, and Alex is going to talk to us about how she approaches or would approach something like this. Okay, so there's a couple of things that are, are coming out for me. There's the pain and the physical issues going on, and then there's also uh, this person is overweight. And the first thing that kind of came to my mind was the agenda sheet, because this person has a lot of things happening, and so... I want to be able to have a conversation with this person to talk about what's their understanding about how these things are interplaying with one another and with the smoking and then kind of work on areas that she might be willing or wanting to address first because there's a lot of stuff there and it would be helpful just to like start off somewhere. Yeah. So getting on a patient's understanding, because you can fill in the gaps, because there are so many things that are associated with her smoking. It's not just, uh, uh, you know, it's just not the rheumatoid arthritis, the macular degeneration, the Crohn's disease, all of these things are associated with, with, with smoking. And, and she may think of them as separate conditions, but they may have a common factor there, which is, uh, which is smoking. Anybody else? Tiny. Tiny. So, so Tanya is one of our therapists in the clinic, and she's going to come. And uh, Amit, who's our fellow, has run down to clinic because one of our other physicians is not here, but I would have picked on him too. So I'll just be short and sweet. Just to add to what Alex said, I would also focus on what it is that she wants to work on currently um, and set small goals. So. Yeah. So, so that's where we would, uh, we would start with. So Candice um, asked, from Sue's perspective, the physical health issues are probably her focus. So that is where we would start the discussion. Absolutely. Uh, what about her day, activities of daily living? Absolutely. What is, what is she able and not able to do? Um, and how is she managing to fit smoking in with all of this? Right? And is she at risk? I mean, you know, people, we know that there are people who land up setting themselves on fires, right? Because now they're not able to move or smoke in bed or some of those dangerous things. And, and that, that's another thing, you, you, the safety is, is, an, is an immediate issue. Uh, provider information about evidence that shows the link between smoking and our health issues, yeah. Uh, Janice would talk about working on motivation and confidence. I think this is one of the key issues. People like this who come into the clinic tend to be kind of, what's the point? Uh, I've got so many things going on where, you know, quitting smoking, I, you know, they come because the doctor sent them, but not because they wanted to be here. Uh, and so really working on that motivation and the confidence to quit becomes uh, a key thing. Anybody else? So, so we have the clinicians, other people who want to maybe comment on how they might approach this and 
and see what they might do with a patient like this. Yeah, I'll show the question again. All right, maybe this is easier for us to spot. What do you think are some of the barriers that she might have in quitting? It just seems that the barrier would be that it's, it's complex. Her, her case is complex, and she's got multiple. And I'm not at all a clinician, but That's OK. Good. Then you're still allowed. I work for the Ministry of Health. Uh, the, um, just on the surface, it would seem that the barriers uh, are simply that where does she begin? Um, she clearly seems to have an interest in both quitting smoking and losing weight. Her family doctor is uh, is telling her to do so, and her secondary conditions would be relieved to a certain extent by doing so. But where to begin? Yeah. Well, you can hardly move. How can you exercise, etc. That's a great question. Honey. Thanks so much for that question. So you know we've been talking about this in the healthcare system right now. We talk about complexity, and really things are complex when we don't know what to do because then they become simple. So the idea is to help make this simple. So one strategy with which is, I think you've heard some of the clinicians talk about, is we have this bubble sheet or this agenda sheet that we work with patients to start putting out all the issues that they see as potential problems. And the way we look at it is we do an analysis by, okay, what's coming in the way of your functioning? Is it environmental issues? Is it your own personal motivations, those kinds of things? Or are there some biological factors at play, right, that are coming in the way? So physical factors, psychiatric factors, and, you know, is it the way you're thinking about things, the way you feel about things, the way you behave about things? So we start looking at it that way, then it starts becoming manageable. So we break it down into small chunks with the person. And then often that's how we move that, make that complex thing become fairly simple. Uh, not to minimize the experience of it, but really that, so that the practitioner doesn't get overwhelmed, is to take that thing and then break it down into these, these chunks. It also allows us to be patient-centered, allows us to do a biopsychosocial in intervention. And that's why you need a team, right? Because the physician has a role, the nurse has a role, the therapist has a role. Uh, we all have a role to make that happen. And the patient has a role, right? The patient has a role as well. Uh, so that's the model of how we would come to doing this. There's another barrier here that did anybody pick up on? If you have rheumatoid arthritis, if you have Crohn's disease, and you have macular de degeneration, how many specialists are you seeing? A lot. So you've got to figure out this person is actually going through a lot of pla places and you know, are they going to be able to show up for your appointments when they've got to do all these different things, right? So clearly developing that therapeutic alliance will be extremely important, as, as Leslie says, because in the absence of that, you're not going to be able to do the difficult work necessary to do smoking cessation, right? Well, for those of you who are medical, our, our, our latest metaphor for trying to do smoking cessation in people who are really who have lots of complexity is you're establishing, you know, in the equivalent of a porter cat, right? A main line, central line, so that you can pass and do some of the tough stuff. If you don't have that either in your therapeutic relationship, they're going to leave, right? You can't do this tough stuff. So uh, if you want to do that, um, you really need to do that. The other barrier you said is mobility due to health conditions and stopping to smoke could lead to weight gain. So this, again, requires in terms of choice of treatment, uh, you might choose bupropion <coughs> as a possibility if everything else is fine, because generally that's the medication associated with the least amount of weight gain when people quit, and in fact might have, it's a, it's a mild antidepressant, might have, if she has an underlying depression, which, which is possible, uh, very highly associated with chronic pain and rheumatoid arthritis and, um, and the Crohn's disease, that she might benefit from a dual action. She may need an antidepressant as well, but another antidepressant, but this is what she would definitely maybe one of the medications might be a choice. Um, and you would need a dietitian involved in this situation because, or some dietary advice because of the weight gain potential uh, with quitting. Um, let's see, there's been a lot of ideas here coming up here in terms of what people could do. Um, 
if being overwhelmed with all the information she's getting. That's right. So we know that if you tell people stuff, potentially after about five minutes they've tuned you out. Just like you know, what potentially happens when you're attending a lecture, uh, you can tune out. So one of the ways to break it up is rather than tell, is practice the ask. So ask, then tell, then ask, and that cadence actually is a quality indicator in the in many health systems. Is does the practitioner first ask the patient what they know about the problem, then share some information, and then ask them again whether they got it. So for somebody like this with complex things, to break it and make it simple is to really take it slowly in the communication. Uh, and that is important uh, because, again, uh, people end up getting completely overwhelmed with the information we give them. So thank you for that. I think that's really critical. Um, Marilyn, uh, Marilyn says, asking about to imagine the future, again, you know, if you're future oriented and you're you know, either doing solution focused therapy or motivation interviewing, that certainly gets her to start setting some goals of what is realistic and feasible and possible for her. Uh, trying to see if you can get to SMART goals where, uh, as with any chronic disease management uh, program, that's what you would do. So Catherine says the visit was not driven by here, and this happens a lot. Patients show up because they don't want to be here. They've been sent here. And one of the ways in which we work that, with, in, and that's what you'll get if you take some, some of the motivational interviewing training, is how do you deal with somebody who doesn't want to be here? And how do you engage them in a therapeutic uh, alliance when they don't want to be there? And clearly there are ways to do that. So if you go back to some of the principles of motivation interviewing, one of the key areas that, that, that helps us stay for, and build that alliance is that we start looking at the fact that they showed up. We reflect on the fact that they showed up, we affirm the fact that they showed up, and get very pragmatic as to what do they need to see happen by this visit. So sometimes that changes the conversation and then keeps them coming back, not because they have to, but because they want to. So. Uh, you know, we have clients who are always with us who don't want to be with us. And the art is converting that from a have to to a want to. Uh, so that's, again, that's a great point, And that's clearly, we won't be able to get into the details of how to do that today. But clearly, uh, strongly recommend, uh, you know, acquiring some of those skills through motivation interviewing or other constructivist therapies that, that help you do that. Um, the finances and coping skills is a, is a critical one. Clearly, they can come in, in the way. And so when we have clients who are struggling with finances, some of that exploration is doing the cognitive work with them, the math, do the math of how much money actually becomes available with quitting smoking. And, and, and our patients here who come in with schizophrenia, one week after quitting smoking, they report that they're actually eating fruits and vegetables. Within two weeks, they're not showing up with clothes that have holes in them and burn holes. They bought clothes. And they bought, so they look differently. Within a couple of weeks, they transform quite, quite dramatically. And so doing the math is a critical part of the treatment plan. Uh, yeah, again, understanding that relationship between pain, Crohn's, and rheumatoid arthritis is an important piece to address. And um, one of the issues, if this person cannot come to several appointments, think about the phone. Think about Smoker's Helpline. You know, if you can't do all of it, this person can use the phone. And clearly, if she's enrolled in a family health team in Ontario anyway, or a CHC, or a, you know, then there's access to NRT. And if she's an ODB, she has access to 12 weeks of Renaclin as well as all 12 weeks of uh, of bupropion for smoking cessation. Okay, so we've covered that. Uh, we've got three minutes to cap, uh, wrap up, but. What I'd like to do now is just wrap this up, uh, the case. The case was to illustrate that generally if you're having a, an, a person showing up with a chronic pain wanting to quit smoking, in general, there'll be an underlying physical condition. And sometimes there may be a, a few of them. Uh, a lot of them are associated with smoking. Our job is to help convert that have to be here to a want to be here. You do that by engaging them, by simplifying, by using a, 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 the bubble sheet to get the goals on the table, and start working on how you then have a biopsychosocial intervention that involves pharmacotherapy, behavioral counseling, and some of the environmental shifts 
that might need to happen. So we know that bouts of physical activity actually can help craving. So how, but with somebody with this mobility problems, how do we get her physically activated? She needs to be physically active in any way through for her other conditions, but those need to be managed. Her chronic pain medications, are they appropriate? Because if somebody's taking uh, Percocets like that uh, for the long term, they're actually not indicated for the management of Crohn's in that way because they may be actually making the pain worse, they may be causing constipation, all these other problems. And so uh, the physician would have to sort out that and, 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 and pass that out. Take a look at the uh, the depression because the, the person like this may need to have that screening for depression. So, which is why every patient coming in does need to be screened for depression, whether you use the PHQ-9 or PHQ-2. You need to have some screening questionnaire that looks at that because often people with chronic disease are missed. Their depression is missed, and the engagement then is missed. So, then what gets attributed to lack of motivation is actually because of an underlying depression that's being missed. And also, not to forget, if they're smoking, to screen for alcohol, because that may also be there, and marijuana and other drugs. And just because they're 62 doesn't mean that they are smoking marijuana. So don't make that assumption. Anyway, so with that, I'd like to thank um, everybody for their participation and for people online for putting their thoughts on, uh, onto their keyboard and typing on that. And love to invite you all back to the Twitter chat that Ali is going to be hosting at 2 PM? Oh, 1 15 actually. Sorry, 1 15 to 2 p.m. Sorry. 1 15 to 2 p.m. We're going to be doing the student chat with the ministry. So uh, thank you everybody for being here and please eat. For those of you in the room, uh, there's some coffee and tea and some snacks in the back. And have a great day and thank you for making the time to be here. So again, thank you to Dr. Peter Selby for joining us today at this Lunch and Learn session. Um, just a reminder, a link to the evaluation will be sent by email. And as well, in that email, you will also receive a link to Learning Assessment 2, which is required to be completed one week after this. Um, and it is a requirement to receive your letter of completion. Again, as a final reminder, if you participated as a group, please make sure to email Eleanor Ball Banting with a complete list of your participants. That includes their first name, last name, and the email by the end of today. And that ensures that all those people who have met the requirements will receive the letter of completion. We hope that you will join us at our next Lunch and Learn webinar, which is scheduled for February 19th, in which we will be joined by Dr. Milan Kara. And Milan will, Dr. Milan Kara will discuss tobacco interventions for patients with concurrent addictions. Thank you again for joining us. Um, for those of you who joined via the webinar, who joined via teleconference, and our live audience, we hope you have a great remainder of the afternoon.